Chapter 12 Behind the Door Alex swam slowly forward, completely blind, afraid that at any moment he would crack his skull against a rock. Despite the dry suit, he was beginning to feel the chill of the water and knew that he had to find his way out soon. His hand brushed against something, but his fingers were too numb to tell what it was. He reached out and pulled himself forward. His feet touched the bottom. And it was then that he realised. He could see. Somehow, from somewhere, light was seeping into the area beyond the submerged tunnel. Slowly, his vision adjusted itself. Waving his hand in front of his face, he could just make out his fingers. He was holding onto a wooden beam, a collapsed roof support. He closed his eyes, then opened them again. The darkness had retreated, showing him a crossroads cut into the rock, the meeting place of three tunnels. The fourth, behind him, was the one that was flooded. As vague as the light was, it gave him strength. Using the beam as a makeshift jetty, he clambered onto the rock. At the same time, he became aware of a soft throbbing sound. He couldn't be sure if it was near or far, but he remembered what he had heard under block D in front of the metal door and he knew that he had arrived. He stripped off the dry suit. Fortunately, it had kept the water out. The main part of his body was dry, but ice-cold water was still dripping out of his hair, down his neck, and his trainers and socks were sodden. When he moved forward, his feet squelched, and he had to take his trainers off and shake them out before he could go on. Ian Ryder's map was still folded in his pocket, but he no longer had any need of it. All he had to do was follow the light. He went straight forward to another intersection, then turned right. The light was so bright now that he could actually make out the colour of the rock, dark brown and grey. The throbbing was also getting louder, and Alex could feel a rush of warm air streaming down towards him. He moved forward cautiously, wondering what he was about to come to. He turned a corner and suddenly the rock on both sides gave way to new brick, with metal grills set at intervals just above the level of the floor. The old mine shaft had been converted. It was being used as the outlet for some sort of air conditioning system. The light that had guided Alex was coming out of the grills. He knelt beside the first of these and looked through into a large, white-tiled room, a laboratory with complicated glass and steel equipment laid out over work surfaces. The room was empty. Tentatively, Alex took hold of the grill, but it was firmly secured, bolted into the rock face. The second grill belonged to the same room. It was also screwed on tight. Alex continued up the tunnel to a third grill. This one looked into a storage room filled with the silver boxes that Alex had seen being delivered by the submarine the night before. He took the grill in both hands and pulled. It came away from the rock easily, and looking closer, he understood why. Ian Ryder had been here ahead of him. He had cut through the bolts which had held it in place. Alex set the grill down silently. He felt sad. Ian Ryder had found his way through the mine, drawn the map, swum through the submerged tunnel and opened the grill all on his own. Alex wouldn't have got nearly as far as this without his help, and he wished now that he had known his uncle a little better and perhaps admired him a little more before he died. Carefully, he began to squeeze through the rectangular hole and lower himself into the room. At the last minute, lying on his stomach with his feet dangling below, he reached for the grill and set it back in place. Provided nobody looked too closely, they wouldn't see anything wrong. 
he dropped down to the ground and landed, cat-like, on the balls of his feet. The throbbing was louder now, coming from somewhere outside. It would cover any noise he made. He went over to the nearest of the silver boxes and examined it. This time, it clicked open in his hands, but when he looked inside, it was empty. Whatever had been delivered was already in use. He checked for cameras, then crossed to the door. It was unlocked. He opened it, one centimetre at a time, and peered out. The door led onto a wide corridor with an automatic sliding door at each end and a silver handrail running its full length. 1900 hours. Red shift to assembly line. Blue shift to decontamination. The voice rang out over a loudspeaker system, neither male nor female, emotionless, inhuman. Alex glanced at his watch. It was already seven o'clock in the evening. It had taken him longer than he'd thought to get through the mine. He stole forward. It wasn't exactly a passage that he had found, it was more an observation platform. He reached the rail and looked down. Alex hadn't had any idea what he would find behind the metal door, but what he was seeing now was far beyond anything he could have imagined. It was a huge chamber, the walls, half-naked rock, half-polished steel, lined with computer equipment electronic meters, machines that blinked and flickered with a life of their own. It was staffed by 40 or 50 people, some in white coats, others in overalls, all wearing armbands of different colours, red, yellow, blue and green. Arc lights beamed down from above. Armed guards stood at each doorway, watching the work with blank faces. For this was where the stormbreakers were being assembled. The computers were being slowly carried in a long, continuous line along a conveyor belt, past the various scientists and technicians. The strange thing was that they already looked finished, and of course they had to be. Sale had told him. They were actually being shipped out during the course of that afternoon and night. So what last-minute adjustment was being made here in this secret factory? And why was so much of the production line hidden away? What Alex had seen on his tour of sale enterprises had only been the tip of the iceberg. The main body of the factory was here, underground. He looked more closely. He remembered the stormbreaker that he had used, and now he noticed something that he hadn't seen then. A strip of plastic had been drawn back in the casing above each of the screens to reveal a small compartment, cylindrical and about five centimetres deep. The computers were passing underneath a bizarre machine, cantilevers, wires and hydraulic arms. Opaque silver test tubes were being fed along a narrow cage moving forward as if to greet the computers. One tube for each computer. There was a meeting point. With infinite precision, the tubes were lifted out, brought round, and then dropped into the exposed compartments. After that, the stormbreakers were accelerated forward. A second machine closed and heat-sealed the plastic strips. By the time the computers reached the end of the line, where they were packed into red and white Sail Enterprises boxes, the compartments were completely invisible. A movement caught his eye, and Alex looked beyond the assembly line and through a huge window into the chamber next door. Two men in biohazard suits were walking clumsily together, as if in slow motion. They stopped. An alarm began to sound, and suddenly they disappeared in a cloud of white steam. Alex remembered what he had just heard. Were they being decontaminated? But if the Stormbreaker was based on the round processor, there couldn't possibly be any need for such an extreme. And anyway, this was like nothing Alex had ever seen before. If the men were being decontaminated, 
What were they being decontaminated from? Agent Grigorovich, report to the biocontainment zone. This is a call for Agent Grigorovich. A lean, fair-haired figure dressed in black detached himself from the assembly line and walked languidly towards a door that slid open to receive him. For the second time, Alex found himself looking at the Russian contract killer, Yasin Grigorovich. What was going on? Alex thought back to the submarine and the vacuum-sealed boxes. Of course, Yasin had brought the test tubes that were even now being inserted into the computers. The test tubes were some sort of weapon that he was using to sabotage them. No, that wasn't possible. Back in Port Talon, the librarian had told him that Ian Ryder had been asking for books about computer viruses. Viruses. Decontamination. The biocontainment zone. Understanding came, and with it, something cold and solid jabbing into the back of his neck. Alex hadn't even heard the door open behind him, but he slowly stiffened as a voice spoke softly into his ear. Stand up. Keep your hands by your sides. If you make any sudden moves, I'll shoot you in the head. He looked slowly round. A single guard stood behind him, a gun in his hand. It was the sort of thing Alex had seen a thousand times in films and on television, and he was shocked by how different the reality was. The gun was a Browning automatic pistol, and one twitch of the guard's finger would send a 9 millimeter bullet shattering through his skull and into his brain. The very touch of it made him feel sick. He stood up. The guard was in his 20s, pale-faced and puzzled. Alex had never seen him before, but more importantly, he had never seen Alex. He hadn't expected to come across a boy. That might help. Who are you? he asked. What are you doing here? I'm staying with Mr. Sale, Alex said. He stared at the gun. Why are you pointing that at me? I'm not doing anything wrong. He sounded pathetic. Little boy lost, but it had the desired effect. The guard hesitated, slightly lowering the gun. At that moment, Alex struck. It was another classic karate blow, this time twisting his body round and driving his elbow into the side of the guard's head, just below his ear. He had almost certainly knocked him out with the single punch, but he couldn't take chances and followed it through with a knee to the groin. The guard folded up, his pistol falling to the ground. Quickly, Alex dragged him back, away from the railing. He looked down. Nobody had seen what happened. But the guard wouldn't be unconscious long, and Alex knew he had to get out of there. Not just back up to ground level, but out of Sale Enterprises itself. He had to contact Mrs Jones. He still didn't know how or why, but he knew now that the Stormbreakers had been turned into killing machines. There were less than 17 hours until the launch at the Science Museum. Somehow, Alex had to stop it from happening. He ran. The door at the end of the passage slid open and he found himself in a curving white corridor with windowless offices built into what must be yet more shafts of the Dosmary mine. He knew he couldn't go back the way he had come. He was too tired and even if he could find his way through the mine, he'd never be able to manage the swim a second time. His only chance was the door that had first led him here. It led to the metal staircase that would bring him to D-Block. There was a telephone in his room. Failing that, he could use the Nintendo DS to transmit a message. But MI6 had to know what he had found out. He reached the end of the corridor, then ducked back as three guards appeared, walking together towards a set of double doors. Fortunately, they hadn't seen him. Nobody knew he was there. He was going to be all right. And then the alarm went off. 
a klaxon barking electronically along the corridors, leaping out from the corners, echoing everywhere. Overhead, a light began to flash red. The guards wheeled around and saw Alex. Unlike the guard on the observation platform, they didn't hesitate. As Alex dived headfirst through the nearest door, they brought up their machine guns and fired. Bullets slammed into the walls beside him and ricocheted along the passageway. Alex landed flat on his stomach and kicked out, slamming the door behind him. He straightened up, found a bolt, and rammed it home. A second later, there was an explosive hammering on the other side as the guards fired at the door. But it was solid metal. It would hold. He was standing on a gantry leading down to a tangle of pipes and cylinders, like the boiler room of a ship. The alarm was as loud here as it had been by the main chamber. It seemed to be coming from everywhere. Alex leapt down the staircase three steps at a time and skidded to a halt, searching for a way out. He had a choice of three corridors, but then he heard the rattle of feet and he knew that his choice had just become two. He wished now that he had thought to pick up the Browning automatic. He was alone and unarmed. The only duck in the shooting gallery, with guns everywhere and no way out. Was this what MI6 had trained him for? If so, 11 days hadn't been enough. He ran on, weaving in and out of the pipes, trying every door he came to. A room with more biohazard suits hanging on hooks. A shower room. Another larger laboratory with a second door leading out. And, in the middle, a glass tank shaped like a barrel and filled with green liquid. Tangles of rubber tubing sprouting out of the tank. Trays filled with test tubes all around. The barrel-shaped tank. The trays. Alex had seen them before as vague outlines on his Nintendo. He must have been standing on the other side of the second door. He ran over to it. It was locked from the inside, electronically, by the glass identification plate against the wall. He would never be able to open it. He was trapped. Footsteps approached. Alex just had time to hide himself on the floor, underneath one of the work surfaces, before the first door was thrown open and two more guards ran into the laboratory. They took a quick look around, without seeing him. Not here, one of them said. You'd better go up. One guard walked out the way he had come. The other went over to the second door and placed his hand on the glass panel. There was a green glow and the door buzzed loudly. The guard threw it open and disappeared. Alex rolled forward as the door swung shut and just managed to get his hand into the crack. He waited a moment, then stood up. He pulled the door open. As he had hoped, he was looking out into the unfinished passageway where he had been surprised by Nadia Vol. The guard had already gone on ahead. Alex slipped out, closing the door behind him, cutting off the sound of the klaxon. He made his way up the metal stairs and through a swing door. He was grateful to find himself back in the fresh air. The sun had already set, but across the lawn the airstrip was ablaze, artificially illuminated by the sort of lights Alex had seen on football pitches. There were about a dozen lorries parked next to each other, Men were loading them up with the heavy, square, red and white boxes. The cargo plane that Alex had seen when he arrived rumbled down the runway and lurched into the air. Alex knew that he was looking at the end of the assembly line. The red and white boxes were the same ones he had seen in the underground chamber. The stormbreakers, complete with their deadly secret, were being loaded up and delivered. By morning, they would be all over the country. Keeping low, he ran past the fountain and across the grass. He thought about making for the main gate, but he knew that was hopeless. 
The guards would have been alerted. They'd be waiting for him. Nor could he climb the perimeter fence, not with the razor wire stretched out across the top. No, his own room seemed the best answer. The telephone was there, and so were his only weapons, the few gadgets that Smithers had given him four days, or was it four years, ago. He entered the house through the kitchen, the same way he had left it the night before. It was only eight o'clock, but the whole place seemed to be deserted. He ran up the staircase and along the corridor to his room on the first floor. Slowly, he opened the door. It seemed his luck was holding out. There was nobody there. Without turning on the light, he went inside and snatched up the telephone. The line was dead. Never mind. He found his Nintendo, all four cartridges, his yo-yo and the zit cream and crammed them into his pockets. He had already decided not to stay there. It was too dangerous. He would find somewhere to hide out. Then he would use the Nemesis cartridge to contact MI6. He went back to the door and opened it. With a shock, he saw Mr. Grin standing in the hallway, looking hideous with his white face, his ginger hair, and his mauve, twisted smile. Alex reacted quickly, striking out with the heel of his right hand. But Mr. Grin was quicker. He seemed to shimmy to one side, then his hand shot out, the side of it driving into Alex's throat. Alex gasped for breath, but no breath came. The butler made an inarticulate sound and lashed out a second time. Alex got the impression that behind the livid scars, he really was grinning, enjoying himself. He tried to avoid the blow, but Mr. Grin's fist hit him square on the jaw. He was spun into the bedroom, falling backwards. He never even remembered hitting the floor.